Thanks, Hexy. <laughs> We're played all the way to the 6 p.m. turn. And, uh, yeah, this is getting uh, intense. Uh, finally reached the breaking point where the Union is just trying to get back to the Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge, uh, East Cemetery Hill, Culp's Hill line. Well, not quite Culp's Hill yet. But the Confederates have pretty much forced them out of Gettysburg. Rhodes Division, who was in great shape, they just got one of those uh, cards where all the units of a brigade that are adjacent to each other can remove their shakens and attempt to do a, a, a go from battle worn back to fresh. And they only fought, well, they really only had one unit that was battle worn. So, um, poor old Harry Heath is still sitting back. I <laughs> just haven't had a need for him yet because. I've been, you know, obviously as Confederates, you want to drive where you have the opportunity. So early has probably done 75% of the fighting for the last four or five turns or three or four turns. And as you can, oh, I'm sorry, you can't see that he's down here. I'll show you in a second. Rhodes really hasn't, he's done a little bit. He, he wasn't even the main actor over here. Um, early had the best offensive opportunities and you can see it right here. So early cleared out pretty much most of this. Now Gordon lost one of his uh, half of his brigade uh, is over there in the matter of fact I think he's in the crushed box. Um, he took an artillery blast that was a C result and it just killed, just destroyed him. But they pretty much there's a couple straggler Union units right here that are going to probably get out unless Rhodes gets an opportunity to catch him. So already started. I'm starting the new turn. But at the end of the 5 p.m. turn, early attacked. And, okay, so East Cemetery Hill is sitting in this area here, all right? Maybe like this, all right? And there's Culp's Hill over here. Uh, he pounded through here. He sent what was Cutler's. He crushed one of Cutler's and sent the other one scurrying away. And that artillery popped Avery's brigade in the face at point blank and rolled 66 and then just sent them running. Um, Gordon's, or not Gordon, but uh, Hayes's, the Louisiana Tigers, one of their half of that brigade is over there in the broken box after an artillery burst from Osborne up on the hill. And he was already in a, uh, he was already on his battle worn side. And Gordon's remaining part of his brigade. Very strong, but these early's regiments or early brigades are really, really good, good morale. But they're facing the Iron Brigade sitting over here. But as you can see, they've come up over this first rise to the southeast of Gettysburg. And here comes that question You made the breakthrough. We need reinforcements, we need something to get in there and help them. And hopefully, hopefully, Rhodes will get that opportunity to get up in here in cause a mishmash for the Union before they can get settled in. So, uh, rest of the battlefield. Let's take a look around here. So, all right, just so we know what's going on here. Uh, First Division, First Corps is sitting here. Second Division has got remnant units in here, and so does the 11th Corps. Um, there's a little bit of everything sitting in here. Baxter from Paul uh, Robinson's division. They're, they got a few back. They got some here. Um, Double Days, boys, his division, the 3rd Division, First Corps, they... They're moving back to the ridge here. Uh, da, 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 let's see. Some of the third corps has arrived. And they've already been somewhat chased away off this front ridge right here. So, yeah, third corps up in front of Cemetery Hill. Well, I don't remember, but when they deployed on the battlefield, if they came all the way up to Cemetery Ridge and then adjusted and moved out to the front. Um, I can't remember if they, because, well, we all know the story. You know, he wanted, Meade wanted them on this line here, okay? But I don't know whether the Third Corps came all the way up and then shifted back and then went out, so. But my Third Corps right now, the first remnants of it, one of its brigades is up here in front of Cemetery Ridge, in front of Cemetery Hill. Um, the cavalry, Buford's cavalry's hung, hung on pretty good. They got away. They're sitting out here on the flank in case anything should happen. Still got some First Corps artillery here. Third Corps artillery's moving up. Um, we got some 11th Corps units again. Krasnowski, who's still sitting right there. <laughs> I got to get him up here. But like I say, it's 
And I'm applying what uh, all the devs were talking about, about using the individual events to do the combat stuff with and using the major cards to try to get reinforcements up. 12th Corps is now on the battlefield, or almost on the battlefield. They're coming in, okay? Uh, I put all the victory point marker markers down on the hexes, so it might throw you off a little bit. Thank God they're small, so you can tell. Um, reinforcements. There's a boatload of stuff down there for the for the Union, Third Corps. And I think, what else they got sitting down there? Uh, some more Double Day stuff sitting down there waiting to come in. That's really all they got on the board right now. The remaining parts of 12th Corps coming in on the Baltimore Pike over here. Confederates are the ones that are in really, really interesting shape. You've got Johnson's division, um, which is going to start to come on this turn and the next turn. You've still got Anderson's division sitting here. Heck, we still got artillery that belongs to Heath. We've got another brigade from Pender. And we've got artillery that belongs to Anderson. All of these are, they're available to come on. I just got to get the draw to get them on. I haven't even been able, Pender got into a little bit of combat here in front of a seminary ridge. Drove off some stuff. But I'm trying to get them maneuvered out here where they can be in a support. The thing is, you know, you always wonder, well, what if I bring divisions and I take them to a different location? Well, <laughs> I don't see that happening in the case of Anderson. Anderson, once he comes in, he's going to have to go out this way because he's going to have to support, the, he's going to protect that flank of Pender. All right, so that's going to happen pretty much historically. Johnson, obviously I need to get him over here with the rest of Yule to help support maybe this push here. I don't know. I, I, this is this use of these cards has really, really got my. There's smoke coming out of my ears because you have got and it doesn't. And you know what? Solo play does not matter. There's to me. There's there. This there's no difference between me playing this by myself than playing against somebody else or multiple people because all if we're playing against multiple people, everybody's gonna be trying to make a decision. And then, of course, you got to hope that the cards fall, all right, the right way. Well, there's the key factor right there, those cards, that fog of war, that, uh, that sort of item that forces your command decision potentially to go one way, or maybe it gives you multiple things to think about, and you got to pick the right one. Well, I, I, doing what's in the best interest of each division or corps or brigade or regiment or whatever, or, I'm sorry, or demi-brigade or artillery, Depending on how the cards draw, sometimes I sit here and I think, okay, geez, do I just use this as a default event and let somebody fire or let somebody move a minimum? Or do I use the event that's on the card, like good ground or battle, you know, or maybe you get battlefield chaos with uh, your, your, the fog of war card or fortunes or whatever it's called. Um, or do I fire an artillery battery, which I, I find I tend to do that a lot because these units, you would, the way the combat table is, you would think it would just be something pretty simple, but it's, you either get lucky if you get a real, real high combat CRT number on the chart uh, or column, you might get a depletion um, on a unit, which means you flip them that are battle-worn. But other than that, you've got to get them shaken. Hopefully they stay shaken. You hit them again and you get them shaken again. Then they deplete to their battle-worn side. Then they can be shaken again. And then if they're shaking on their battle-worn side, you shake them again, then they're going to they're gonna be pulled off the map as broken. So while there are quite a few Union regiments over there, or Union units over there, there's five in the broken box. There are three in the crushed box, three or two. The Confederates have one in each box. So definitely advantage Confederates right now in this fight. All right. <laughs> This system is working very, very, very good. Okay, so I think I put it in one of my comments. GBACW is my super detailed thing. Love GBACW, all right? But that's that's a lot of, it's. I don't want to say it's a lot of work playing that game. There's a lot of detail to that game, a lot of, you know, command stuff like that. This game has that stuff, but they've sort of, minimize it. They've cut it down and to a point where the flow of the game is easier. There's not as many rules that you have to dig into. Um, 
and you're getting a pretty damn decent result. So I'm going to say it again. If you have this thing and you haven't put it on the table, dug through the rules, put throw some damn counters down, pull a couple cards out, and just mess around with it, and you'll pick up the system real fast. The things that you're going to have to watch for, the, well, like one of the things that I miss all the time is the when I roll doubles, but I think the last two or three turns I haven't missed it yet. Because you got a chart for when you roll doubles on fire combat or assault combat that applies to the firer. Or that applies to the assaulting, attacking unit in assault. And then to the defending unit in assault. And since both sides roll for assault, then you might roll doubles for the attacker or you might roll doubles for the defender or you might roll doubles for both. And there's some interesting results in that column. It's not a whole bunch. It's just a few things on the back side of your CRT. Over on this thing here, there's, you know, you can only roll six possible sets of doubles, all right? And then you've got the close fight where you get a C result and you get a close fight like here because they intersect. And then you go back over this table and you roll, a, you roll two six-sided dice and you get your result right here, all right? It's, pretty, it's actually pretty cool. I mean, you know, like there's not a hundred of them to look at there. That would have been awesome. But uh, it gives you some different outcomes that you might not expect, you know, where maybe the trumpeter for the 42nd Connecticut regiment stood up and played the, played his charge call so good that the unit just got motivated and just drove three Confederate regiments out of the out of the orchard or something. Like that. You know, that's that's how you, you put those things in your head. You make the stuff up yourself as as you go, depending on what your result is. You can just write whatever story you want. Okay, so we're about to get to the end of the first day couple more turns before dusk falls. Um, we are going to be attacking over here. We're going to do everything we can. we got to get roads moving. Need to get those reinforcements in. The Union needs to get troops up. Uh, and that may have to be the priority, is to get flood some of these troops up here as fast as we can. you got some good morale here in the 12th Corps, it looks like. So, All right, first day of Gettysburg. A most fearful sacrifice, Herman Lutman game, released this year, Flying Pig Games. And we're getting ready to close out. Probably the next one you'll see will be sometime during the second day. We're blowing through this thing pretty good. All right, let's get this up. Talk to you all soon.